Skyrim, the tenth game in the Elder Scrolls series, the fifth main titled game. Throughout this series of videos, I've been rewriting the main quest of Skyrim, Dawnguard, and Dragonborn, asking one simple question, what if Skyrim was good? No, I mean really good. Okay, so any of you who are watching this series for the first time should really click the link in the video description, but the usual disclaimer applies, some people are going to like it, some people are going to hate it, but at the end of the day, it's just fan fiction, and it's never going to happen. Now the biggest question I got in this series, why did you even call it What If Skyrim Was Good? Why didn't you call it the more appropriate What If Skyrim Was Better? Or What If Skyrim Was The Way I Wanted It? And the answer is that this is all part of the ideal Elder Scrolls series. And quite frankly, the hyperbolic title gets fanboys' mouths just foaming with rabid rage. And it's a good thing, because they dance like puppets in my comment section and amuse me. It's not about the view count, it's about their tears. So, let's get on with the tears, let's get on with the rage, and let's finish this up. So to quote a horrible, horrible Japanese cartoon, my love, anger, and all of my sorrow. Today we're talking about the Civil War. Let's start off with the Imperial side of the Civil War. In this version, we should have a heavy, heavy focus on the fact that the Stormcloaks come from Skyrim, whereas the Imperials are importing all of their equipment, importing their troops by road and by ocean to the north. And we should have supply ship problems. And while half of it is literally sticking it to the Stormcloaks, there should be problems. Like the Stormcloaks being in league with some Red Guard pirates who are cutting off the supply lines. And likewise, they're doing guerrilla ambushes on the trade caravans. You see, in Skyrim, all of the Legionnaires are basically locals. The Legion recruited from the local Nords. Well, in this version of the story, the war is much bigger because we can assume that a majority of the Nords sided with the Stormcloaks and that only the most loyal stayed with the Empire. So we would be seeing a lot more of all the other races in the Imperial Legion, not just Nords. And we want to make the starting situation seem a bit dire because the Stormcloaks are locals. They know the secret routes. They know how to best ambush people. And in general, they're just masters of the land to which they were born. So the Stormcloaks are actually cutting off Imperial supply lines, causing all kinds of havoc. The Imperials cannot stand this anymore. This is assuming you're playing as the Imperials. So it's your job to clean up the mess. Think of the Pirates of Skyrim mod, where you're on the ocean, on a ship. Well, this time you are basically protecting cargo and troops coming through and ultimately the ship gets ambushed, you have to kill the pirates, and you find some information out about what Ulfric promised these Red Guards in exchange for their services, because these aren't just pirates, they're privateers. They're hired pirates by the Stormcloaks. So there are certain factions of the Red Guard that are actually against the Empire at this point. And now it's time to secure the Cyrodiil border. You see, because we want the Civil War to feel dynamic, we're going to say that Falkreath was attacked by the Stormcloaks and is occupied by them now. The reinforcements at the Cyrodiil Gate are completely cut off. And this begs the question, what happened to the Imperial Commander? The one who was at Helgen previously? The one who almost had your head chopped off? We're going to tell a story about how she was demoted. So it was her job to babysit these caravans back and forth from Cyrodiil to Falkreath because Falkreath is the southern trading hub that leads up to Whiterun, where everything is distributed to the rest of Skyrim. But she's nowhere to be found. In reality, she betrayed the Empire for the Stormcloaks. See, it turns out she was a Nord, born in Falkreath, loyal to the Empire, and how does General Tullius repay her decades of service? By demoting her and making her babysit some caravans. It was a disgrace. Anyway, you won't learn most of this until you're confronted with her, where you'll have an opportunity to just straight up kill her or engage her in conversation where she will be so pissed at you. And remember, at this point in the story, you are confirmed to be the Dragonborn, so she will more or less... So she'll more or less rub it in your face. If you really were the Dragonborn, you would be on the Nord's side. And she'll allude to something, or are you trying to be the next Tiber Septim or something. Well, you're not going to be able to do that being an Empire lapdog. 
You can use an intimidation skill check to make her lower her weapons and submit to Imperial Judgment. You can use a persuasion skill check to make her just leave and go away. Or you could fight her. Now if you persuade her to leave, you'll have two opportunities. You can either lie to Hadvar and tell him that she's dead. But if your persuasion skill isn't high enough, you're going to have to tell the truth. He's going to be extremely disappointed in you. And he's basically going to tell General Tullius that she got away. And General Tullius is going to look at both of you like, you both failed me. And it's not going to be cool. Obviously, either killing her, making her surrender, or lying to Hadvar are the only ways to get your proper reward. Now, there should be some more emphasis as you progress through the quest of the fact that you are the Dragonborn. At some point after capturing a fort, General Tullius should arrive at that fort. And immediately afterward, a dragon should attack it. You should have to, in front of General Tullius, kill and absorb a dragon soul. General Tullius should be forced to recognize the fact that you're Dragonborn, you're kind of higher up the totem pole than Hadvar is. So from then on, you'll be taking your orders directly from General Tullius. Because you are Dragonborn, General Tullius is going to see you as a convenient tool to be used. You see, because you know in this version, Ulfric Stormcloak is of questionable lineage. They think maybe he is the descendant of Tiber Septum. Specifically, before he became known as Tiber Septim when he was still Talos of Etmora. This is what the legends are saying. Basically, that Ulfric Stormcloak is of the dragon blood, and therefore, dragonborn. Although he has never absorbed a dragon soul, although he has killed a dragon earlier in the story, as we said earlier. But, the whole point is, because you are dragonborn, because you have these dragon shouts, it should be obvious now that the key to undermining the faith Stormcloaks have in their leader is to show them that they're going up against another Dragonborn and that Ulfric is not the only one who has the legitimate claim to the throne. So what he's going to do is he's going to hold a meeting where all the people of Solitude come, Jarl Elisif comes, the blacksmith, everyone in town basically gathers at the fort. You'll be standing up on a balcony or wherever. We're going to add a new balcony so it's convenient. But the point is that you'll be up there with General Tullius. General Tullius will introduce you and pretty much say Ulfric isn't the only Dragonborn. This is the last true Dragonborn. And Ulfric is a mere pretender. And he'll have you do a dragon shout out into the air. And everyone will be like, The power of old! The Thum! And General Tullius will basically say, This man or woman has sworn his or her allegiance to the Empire. And he'll just tell everyone, Spread the word far and wide to all the corners of Skyrim that this true loyal Dragonborn is being made General Tullius' second in command. And that the true Dragonborn comes for you, Ulfric. And anyone who once sided with the Stormcloaks who wants to now pledge their allegiance alongside of the true Dragonborn is free to do so. Renounce your place among the Stormcloaks and all will be forgiven. Join the Legion and help us unite the Empire. And you should literally see like a line going into Castle Darrow of all these citizens who were just basic, you know, uh, bar patrons and stuff like that, they're signing up for the Legion now because they saw you do a Fusro Da across the courtyard. Now, after a couple more victories, you should get a note from Ulfric Stormcloak himself saying that it's time we had a face-to-face -face meeting. And one of two things will happen. Either you can follow the note and go see Ulfric Stormcloak or optional objective, report the note to General Tullius. If you go to see Ulfric Stormcloak yourself, you'll meet in this area behind Windhelm. It'll just be Ulfric Stormcloak and you, and Ulfric will ask you, are you really Dragonborn? You'll have the option to be coy with him and say, I'm not sure, or you'll have the option to tell him everything about the Greybeards, about Alduin, about absorbing Dragon Souls. If you're coy with him, he'll flat out just say, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to kill you because people are thinking that you're the Dragonborn. You've cost me about one-third of my troops already. I, we were winning this war before you stepped in. It's time you die. And you'll have to do a boss battle with Ulfric. After you get his health really low, he'll use a, a ethereal shout and literally flee into Windhelm. Not very heroic, is it? Yeah. Now, the other option, if you just tell him everything, he'll be fairly shocked, but... He'll ask you, is this true? And you'll have a persuade skill check. 
And if you manage to persuade him that it's true, he'll offer you a place among the Stormcloaks and say flat out that the two Dragonborn should stand together. And if you swear your allegiance to me, we two Dragonborns standing together, we can bring peace to Skyrim and then we can defeat Alduin in that order. If you refuse him, it'll go back around to the you're going to kill him. But if you do join him, then you'll immediately be hated by all of Solitude and all the Imperial governed areas. And now the Civil War shifts with you having to undo all the damage that you just did. You'll have to recapture all the forts that you just captured and do things on the Stormcloak side. But let's assume that for a moment you successfully defeated Ulfric and he went ethereal and ran back into Windhelm. So you go to report to General Tullius and tell him what happened. And General Tullius will get pissed at you because if he knew this was going to happen, if you had told him, he would have sent a legion with you to take out Ulfric. He'll be disappointed in you, but he'll say we've got to get over it because we're going to the next target. And the war will continue. Now, if you had reported to General Tullius, then Ulfric Stormcloak won't even get into you with are you really the Dragonborn or anything like that. He'll just flat out ambush all of you. And he'll still do a boss battle against Ulfric. But every once in a while, he'll literally just during the battle go just turn toward the biggest cluster of enemy troops and just go Fusro Da and send them all flying off the nearest mountain or ridge or into the lake or wherever the hell you are. And when you get Ulfric to about half health, Ulfric will shout, second wave, crush them now, and you'll have literally more troops coming in. And they'll try to attack General Tullius. General Tullius will call for the retreat, and you have two options. You can either retreat with General Tullius or defeat all the soldiers there. Now, if you defeat all the soldiers there, keep in mind that the Imperials have already retreated, so capturing Ulfric isn't an option. Ulfric will still become ethereal, run back into Windhelm again. General Tullius won't be disappointed in you. He'll know that you went one-on-one -on -one with Ulfric. It doesn't matter if you ran away when he commanded you to run away, or you got away after defeating Ulfric. He'll flat out say, you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ulfric, and that is amazing. We're going to need your support in this next venture. And either way, you go to the next objective. So here's the deal. The siege on Windhelm shouldn't be viable at all. You know that big bridge to Windhelm? Well, the moment you guys try to attack the city, they're going to collapse the bridge. And they're going to start pelting you with siege equipment from inside the city walls. They're just going to be throwing like huge rocks over the city walls and stuff like that. So they pretty much turned Windhelm into a fortress. But the fortress has one weakness, you see. Remember I told you that the Dunmer, you know, had their Grey Quarter, and the Grey Quarter basically grew into this gigantic area? Well, for it to grow into that gigantic area, they had to take down some city walls. And they built up new walls, but those walls are makeshift at best. They're weaker. So after this protracted fight, you guys circle around the city, and bust through the wall into the Dunmer district. You've got to fight Telvanni wizards, you've got to fight all these people, all these refugees from Vardenfell, many whom are skilled Redoran warriors. So it's massive losses on both sides. When you finally get through the Dunmer district, you find out that there's a huge wall of Nords there. You take this Great House's council as kind of hostages, but you find out the Stormcloaks aren't in a negotiating mood, meaning that you've got all these Dunmer prisoners and no real purpose for them. So General Tullius starts off to his command tent, where they're going to basically go over the details of the next battle. They ask General Tullius as he's leaving, what do we do about the Dunmer prisoners? And he goes, I don't have time for this, let my second handle it. So you have three options. One, if we keep them captive this whole time, we're gonna need to send like five or 10 of our soldiers to keep an eye on them and keep them from getting out. It's not an ideal situation because it reduces our fighting strength. Number two, we can let them go, but then they might circle around and ambush us later. They might actually join the Stormcloak forces again, and that's not good because it means that their fighting strength will be greater once we get to the main battle. The third option, kill the prisoners. No mercy. This is a defining moment here for your character because 
if you kill all the prisoners, every Dunmer in Skyrim is going to hear about it, and they're going to hate your guts. Is there a side quest where you're supposed to get Ice Wraith teeth or something? She won't give you that quest. She won't talk to you anymore. You can't buy and sell with her. I hope you like having Murag Tong assassins coming after you when you sleep, because that's what's going to happen to you every month or so. So, for the purposes of the battle, the evil choice, killing all the prisoners, is the best one. But it's going to have long-term consequences if you do that. Assuming you don't kill the prisoners, you have the option of diminishing your forces or bolstering theirs. Now, the main battle for the city should be chaos. And I mean that because we should have people coming in and out of their homes, you know, regular citizens that are not dressed up like Stormcloaks attacking your people, meaning that you actually have to kill some members of the city. The Temple of the Old Kingdom is going to send its warriors out, keeping in mind that these are kind of like clerics in the sense that they use restoration magic to heal allies and channel divine power in the way you'd expect them to in either Daggerfall or Morrowind. You know, temple priests tending to be more powerful than your common, everyday spellcaster. Now, the members of the Temple of Junal will sequester themselves, unless you happen to be the Archmage of the College of Winterhold, in which case, you can actually go and order them to assault the city from the inside. Ultimately, coming into the Hall of Kings, you should have to fight tons of guards, ultimately ending at Ulfric Stormcloak himself, as well as two or three thanes. Ulfric will want to talk to you, and and depending on how your meeting went with him earlier, he will either have great respect for you or still call you just a dog of the Empire. Ulfric will have some pretty profound questions for you, like, do you believe in Ysmir? And you will have the option to tell him that the Greybeards have proclaimed me Ysmir. Ulfric will remark on the irony of the situation that Yismir worship was banned and now the new proclaimed Yismir is the one who is fighting against his very name and that it would be a comedy worthy of the Bard's College. There should be three or four more dialogue choices and every once in a while General Tullius should say just hurry up and end it and you have the opportunity to acquiesce to General Tullius's command or to engage Ulfric in a few more lines of dialogue it should be reminiscent of the way we were able to talk to Dagoth Ur in great length prior to fighting him. So General Tullius will just want to charge in and kill Ulfric at this point, and you have the opportunity to make the decision. Are you going to fight Ulfric Stormcloak in one-on-one -on -one combat, as is the Nord's tradition? Or are you going to just charge in with all the Imperial troops at your back and kill Ulfric Stormcloak that way? If you kill him in one-on-one -on -one combat, then the Stormcloaks will surrender unconditionally, and they will pledge themselves not to the new empire, but to the new Dragonborn. However, if you charge in, then you're going to have to exterminate all the Stormcloaks they're going to fight to the last, because you're a dishonorable bastard. If you defeat Ulfric Stormcloak one-on-one, -on -one, and the remaining Stormcloak forces pledge themselves to your service as the Dragonborn, so what will happen is, is you will replace Ulfric as the Jarl of Windhelm, as such, any other Thane ships you had in a different city are null and void, because you can't be the Thane of a different city and the Jarl of Windhelm. It just doesn't work that way. But as the new Jarl of Windhelm, you'll be able to appoint a new steward, and you'll be able to appoint various people to handle the day-to-day -day affairs in your absence, so you can continue to be an adventurer. But people will know you now as the Jarl of Windhelm. So after becoming the Jarl of Windhelm, you'll be summoned to Solitude. They're going to be talking about a moot happening soon, and they want you to make a statement in favor of Jarl Elisif. They also talk about how to solidify the bloodlines and make sure that there isn't any feuding in the future. It turns out that Torrig and Elisif maybe had two or three children. I want to say two girls and one boy or something like that. So no matter which gender your character is, they offer one of those children to you as a betrothal in the idea that when they've grown up enough, that you'll be married. And you can deny the request, in which case they won't like you very much, but they'll accept it. Or you get betrothed, in which case you won't be able to marry anyone else. Because your promise to that specific child, whether it's a boy or a girl, is the opposing gender of whatever your character is. Obviously, you can say screw that and no real consequences. If your character's already married, then that doesn't come up at all. 
And finally, if you didn't honorably take over Windhelm, then a different person among the community steps up and basically takes the Jarl ship of Windhelm. The Jarl ship of Windhelm only falls to you if you defeated Ulfric honorably. Now, all the Stormcloak camps are still going to be around regardless of whether you killed Ulfric honorably or not. If you killed them honorably, the Stormcloaks will take on the armor and the title of whatever their hold they're in. So, you know, Whiterun hold, Winter hold, so on and so forth. Like, they will take on the appropriate name because they basically return to the service of their local Jarl, but they're still dealing with bandits and other things. However, if you killed Ulfric dishonorably, they will start attacking and trying to recapture forts, and you will have to systematically wipe out all of the Stormcloak camps in order to secure final victory. So that's the Civil War in a nutshell for the Imperials. Now, let's talk about the Stormcloak side. So, most of the same stuff applies, except you will be trying to sabotage Imperial reinforcements. That means you're going to get a hold of the Red Guards and deal with their emissaries, do a lot of shady work in the shadows in order to get pirate ships to start attacking their stuff. You're going to join the pirates and actually steal some Imperial ships. You'll help mastermind the conquest of Falkreath Hold, and then once Falkreath has been conquered, you'll begin intercepting Imperial reinforcements from Cyrodiil, at which point you will come face to face with that Imperial commander who tried to chop your head off in Helgen. Except instead of joining you because it's you, that person that vexed her, she's associated you with all the crap that's happened at Helgen, she is pissed and she wants you dead. But when you kill her elite guards, she'll flee, she'll be gone, and then you'll turn in the quest. It turns out she's sending more Imperial reinforcements to attack Falkreath and other nearby towns, but these seem kind of odd. They're wearing Imperial uniforms, but they're not sure these are soldiers at all. See, it turns out that she basically joined a group of bandits. She had already been demoted. She wasn't going to be able to live with the failure of also not being able to protect these transports. And she thought about joining the Stormcloaks, but then she saw you, and that's it. She hates your guts, and she joined a bunch of bandits instead. So you've got to go through this bandit fort, and you got to kill her. Because it turns out that she's taking all the reinforcements from Cyrodiil, all the caches of armor and stuff, and she's outfitting these bandits to look like Imperial soldiers. Same stuff applies. You can convince her to turn over the fort to Imperial control. You can convince her to run away or you can kill her. Now eventually Ulfric Stormcloak will witness you take over a fort, you'll kill a dragon, he'll realize that you're Dragonborn, and now we've got a problem because there's two Dragonborns. So he'll ask for a meeting, he'll want to speak with you privately outside, and he'll ask you what your intentions are. And you have the opportunity to be coy with him, in which case he'll say that he stand the risk of having a insurgency from within the Stormcloaks, so he's gonna have to have you killed. Or you can just tell him everything, in which case he'll understand, and he'll just tell you to keep it quiet, don't let a bunch of other people know that you're Dragonborn, don't shout in public, and basically just keep this secret. And once the Civil War is done, then together you guys can stop Alduin. That's what he tells you. If you disagree, you gotta fight Ulfric. If you manage to defeat Ulfric, he goes running back into Windhelm. You will be approached by some Penitus Oculatus, um, Imperial Secret Forces, who are watching this whole thing. And they'll tell you that we would like you to join the Imperials. We know that the Stormcloaks hate you now, they're going to have a hit out on you, they're going to try to kill you, but we know you're Dragonborn, and we want you to defeat Ulfric. So you'll have the opportunity to defect to the Imperials if you do that. If you don't defect to the Imperials, then Stormcloaks will still hate your guts, the Imperials really won't know who you are, so you'll have the opportunity to go to the Penitus Oculatus anytime you want and agree to join them. Now assuming you agree Dolfric's plan, up until now you've been getting all your orders from Rolf. Well, now that's not happening anymore. You're dealing with Ulfric's second-in-command now. And while neither side in the Civil War, neither the Imperials or the Stormcloaks, will come out and say certain things, you'll have the opportunity throughout the quest lines to engage some of the uh, named soldiers on either side. 
and ask them what they think about Ulfric or Queen Elisif. And when they have the opportunity to talk to about Jarl Elisif, they'll say that she's an idiot. She doesn't have a single thought in her head, and that Falk Firebeard is effectively the Jarl. And if you talk about Ulfric, some of them will revere him outright and say he's the Dragonborn, he's the true heir to the Empire, you know, he's the next Tiber Septum, it's true. But then others among the Stormcloaks will say they really don't know Ulfric's intentions. He's supposed to be Dragonborn, right? And the dragons are coming back? Is it because he's pissed off the dragons? He's gone against the dragon's will? The Empire is representative of the dragon, after all. Could it be that when the Dragonborn turned against the dragon, which is the Empire, that he set all this in motion? And either side will be able to say this, you know, where they're pretty sure that there's something shady going on with Ulfric, the fact that he's so super strong, and uh, it just doesn't make sense why he would choose this path for war over worship of Ysmir, when, where if he was the Dragonborn, he could in theory go to the Greybeards and be proclaimed Ysmir, the Dragon of the North, but he doesn't do that, he doesn't go to see the Greybeards, why not? And there's some other rumors that Ulfric has already been to see the Greybeards and the Greybeards rejected him, knowing that he is of the Dragon Blood, but he's not truly Dragonborn. And there, there's rumors going back and forth, and they hear that you know, fr reports from White Wren say that there is a true Dragonborn who is not Ulfric, and so there's doubt being sowed among the various troops, and you should get some mixed messages, like, Ulfric's the shady guy who maybe the Stormcloaks can't really trust, and that the second-in-command for the Stormcloaks is kind of getting ready to take over if Ulfric betrays them. And they're really, really, really hoping that Ulfric isn't in league with the dragons. But the main thing is that we need to have a wide array of opinions about Ulfric. Obviously, the people who worship him uh, unconditionally, the people who believe in his cause but aren't too sure about him, and then the people who are just like, this guy's shady as all hell. I, I, I don't... I, I agree with his ideals, but I, did, I don't know if I can serve him anymore. It exists in both sides, so the Imperials would have the exact same thing where they're looking at Jarl Elisif, she's an idiot, and who do you want? Do you want a shady guy who you don't know if you can trust? Or do you want an idiot who is more or less a puppet of the Empire? So the idea is there is no, no true path here because on the side of the Empire is the sacrificing of the Nord way, the worship of Ysmir. But they would keep the power of the Jarls, everything would be independent, every hold would basically be its own kingdom. Whereas over here, if you give Ulfric the crown of the High King of Skyrim, and then he starts a war with, with the Empire, and starts to try to take over the Empire, that, that's their main fear, is that Ulfric is going to not be satisfied with the conquest of Skyrim, that he's then going to push south. And there's a big fear, within the Empire, that the Thalmor are going to take advantage of this. That the Aldmeri Dominion might go and, for the sake of securing peace, wipe out both forces. And it's very important that NPCs throughout the world express a wide array of ideas on this. And we should really take each viewpoint and apply it to one or two NPCs on each side. So, as the player speaks to these different named soldiers, they should get different views on this. There should be no one true uh, perspective. That there is not um, Ulfric good, Empire bad. That, that doesn't work. It, ultimately, both sides are shady as hell. Both sides are probably going to cause something bad to happen. And you're just picking whichever side you think is the best. Now, if you attack Solitude going up, they're going to hear about, you know, all their other fortresses having been defeated, and they're going to have barriers in place. They're going to have collapsed those archways leading up to Solitude. So, literally, the main city gates are inaccessible entirely. And they're looking at the docks, because remember, we've expanded the Imperial docks to have warships there. So, 
what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go by water. You're going to have to sneak in and man one of their warships, then turn their cannons, because keep in mind that cannons are a thing in the Elder Scrolls, it's just people forget about it for whatever reason. Either way, you're going to man the cannons, and you're going to use the cannons to blow open the gates to the docks, while other members of your team are basically going to use the other cannons to blow up the opposing ships. And you're going to get off before one of the other ships gets wise and blows up yours. Total chaos in the bay, and the gates to the docks open, Stormcloaks are going to come in, and they're going to go up the tower into solitude. Once all the chaos in the bay is done, and you have conquered the bay, you're going to have captured a ton of mercenaries from these ships that have sunk. Now these mercenaries are... some of them will defect almost immediately, saying, I'm not paid enough for this. You'll have the same kind of deal you had with the Stormcloaks. So you'll have the same deal you had with the Dunmer, where you'll either have soldiers looking after the mercenaries to make sure that they don't join the enemies, in which case your forces are diminished. You let the mercenaries go, in which case some of them will honor their original commitment and join the Imperials, or you can kill them all. Now, because they're mercenaries, you get a fourth option to pay them off, which is a colossal amount of money. If you have it, congratulations, but ultimately only about half of them will take the deal, so you'll have the same thing as you had before, except instead of losing 10 soldiers, you'd only lose 5. Instead of having a lot of extra enemies, you'd only have a few extra enemies, or you'd only have to kill a few mercenaries. Now, because these mercenaries would be red guards, Alakir, basically, you would alienate every red guard in the province. So, if a Red Guard had a quest for you, well, congratulations, same deal. So that's pretty much it. You go in, you fight General Tullius to the death, Jarl Elisif surrenders without a fight, and her thanes just kind of give up. If you aren't a member of the Dark Brotherhood yet, a member of the Dark Brotherhood is going to try to kill you. And members of the Dark Brotherhood will continue to be sent after you until you join them or you go and deal with Astrid. And there should be a breadcrumb trail to be able to deal with Astrid whilst not actually joining the Dark Brotherhood, in which case you lose access to the Dark Brotherhood because you did that. Remember everyone, a role-playing game has choices and consequences. But if you do join the Dark Brotherhood, or you were already a member of the Dark Brotherhood, or you were their leader, either way, you'd be told that there's a contract out for you. And it was one of the Thanes of Windhelm that came up with the contract in the first place. So you avoid having Dark Brotherhood members come after you if you're already a member of the Dark Brotherhood because, because they don't kill their own without reason, so they decline the contract. But when you go to investigate the person who sent the contract out after you, it turns out that this was done under Ulfric's orders. You are betrayed by Ulfric. Why? Well, because there can be only one Dragonborn, and as long as you live, you are a threat to Ulfric's power. And the dialogue will be based on how far you are in the quest, because if you've already defeated Alduin, then he'll just get straight to the point that he has ambitions to conquer the entire Empire, and that as long as you are a Dragonborn that is not of his bloodline, then you are a threat to his power, and therefore you must die. But if Alduin hasn't been defeated yet, and you ask him, what about Alduin? Weren't we going to fight him together? And he says, the Greybeards are fools. I don't believe that Alduin's return, just like I don't believe that you're Ysmir. I've killed dragons before, and I'll continue to kill them. Now, at this point, you'll get several options. You can use a Persuade check to, once again, swear your oath to Ulfric, and get, convince him that you are not a threat. You can kill him, in which case everyone will be thrown into chaos because the Stormcloaks are now leaderless. Their second in command is going to try to hold everything together, but it's not really working. The next option will be to challenge him to a duel, an honorable duel. He'll just basically scoff at you and attack anyway. Like, he has no interest in doing an honorable duel. And the final option is for you to call for the guards. If you call for the guards, then the guards and Ulfric second in command, a bunch of other people will come in and they'll overhear your conversation. So you'll then have the opportunity to challenge Ulfric to a duel, as is the Nord custom. 
So, in front of all these other people, Ulfric has no choice. He has to accept the challenge. And once you defeat him, congratulations, you're the Jarl of Windhelm. You take control of the Stormcloaks. And it's pretty much the same thing as the Imperial ending, except that there's still Imperial resistance here and there, and you gotta wipe them all out. Having defeated Ulfric Stormcloak, you'll still have the opportunity to barter for peace by betrothing yourself. One of Toreg and Elisif's kids, that's fine. You don't have to, but that pretty much solves the Civil War. You are given a task to wipe out the Imperial Remnants, and Skyrim is yours, or Ulfric's, depending on how you dealt with the situation. Either way, I need to explain why these changes are in place. Number one, the freedom of choice. There needed to be multiple choices along the path, and those were not given to you. It was linear, it was lame, and it needed to be changed. This is what I did right here. Also, a lot of people accused me of being pro-Stormcloak, but the problem is, is that, in my opinion, in the vanilla game, the Stormcloaks were a garbage faction. That's why I legitimized Ulfric Stormcloak, by giving him Septum Blood, more or less. And by legitimizing his claim to the throne, you gave him a reason to look less like a shady motherfucker, but he is still a shady motherfucker. I gave him super strength and the ability to kill dragons because, again, he needed to be this person to be idolized. And if you never actually pressed the issue, like, what do you think about Ulfric, to all the different people in Skyrim, you would have never known that, hey, this guy is, he's, he's probably going to try to attack the Empire, you know? And so if you just played through the quest line normally, and you didn't actually go and engage people in dialogue, it would have been kind of a surprise when he turned on you at the end. However, knowing what you know, talking to him, talking to his second in command, all of a sudden, you know, maybe Ulfric isn't the most trustworthy guy, you know, and leaving him in command of uh, re-swearing your allegiance to him? Is he going to send more assassins after you? I don't know. But the point is, it needed to be more complex than it was. The Civil War was laughably simple, and they did not play up the fact that the Empire was from a different land. They didn't play up the concept of supply lines and, you know, battlefield tactics and things that I felt should have been a part of the war. And I could go on for another hour explaining how I would have done the Civil War, but I frankly don't have time. So there you have it. That is my version of the Skyrim Civil War in a nutshell. Next time, I'm going to be talking about various side quests and Daedric quests. And if you think this one was fan fiction-y, just wait till you see what I do in the next one. I imagine a lot of people aren't going to like it when I get into what if Skyrim was good, all the side quests. Until then, if you liked this episode, give it a like. If you disliked it, give it a dislike. It's okay, but please, please leave a comment. Check the social media links above for more content, and until then, I will see y'all next time.